Hi there, Why Religion friends. Anthony Sweat here from BYU's Church History and Doctrine. Welcome to another great episode of Why Religion. At the start of each semester, in one of my classes here at BYU, we explore ways to approach sources of church history and doctrine. As we discuss and analyze what establishes official doctrinal positions for the church, I have my students do an assignment where they analyze various statements on the date for the birth of Jesus Christ. They read a quote from Elder Bednar and one from President Kimball, one from Harold B. Lee, and one from James E. Talmadge, all agreeing that April 6th is Jesus' birth date. The students usually feel settled and fine. But then they also read some statements from Elder Orson Pratt, President J. Reuben Clark, and Elder Bruce R. McConkie, who all give differing dates in months and years for the Savior's birth. Elder McConkie wrote, quote, We do not believe it is possible with the present state of our knowledge, including that which is known both in and out of the church, to state with finality when the natal day of the Lord Jesus actually occurred. This is not a settled issue, end of quote. Well, this unsettled issue, in the words of Elder McConkie, is one that Professor Jeff Chadwick from BYU's Department of Church History and Doctrine has explored from an academic perspective with some fascinating conclusions. I think the best date to place Jesus' birth at is probably where scholarship places it in December of 5 BC. This is President Clark of the First Presidency writing 20 years after Elder Talmadge. Oh, well, this is interesting. Uh, what do I do with this? Well, I guess it means that Latter-day Saints of authority and, and good spirit can, can see things differently. And so it's only after I discovered, you know, uh, President Clark and that Elder McConkie had basically followed President Clark's lead that I thought it's probably okay to open this subject. In today's episode, get ready to open this interesting subject of dating Jesus Christ's birth, also his death, and the year that Lehi left Jerusalem, a trilogy of articles from Professor Jeff Chadwick. It's an enlightening academic journey with some surprisingly edifying and applicable conclusions. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Ryan Sharp interviewed with his BYU religion colleague, Professor Jeff Chadwick, to discuss his trilogy of landmark articles published in BYU Studies on dating the birth and death of Jesus Christ and the year Lehi and Sarai's family departed from Jerusalem. In part one, he will discuss his reasons for why he concludes that Jesus Christ was born in December of the year 5 BC, rather than in April of 1 BC, as commonly claimed in traditional Latter-day Saint sources. Next, he discusses in detail the dating of Lehi and Sarai's family's departure from Jerusalem. In part two, he will help us understand why this matters. And in part three, he'll share some of the whys about his own academic journey and training and his own faith. So here's Professor Ryan Sharp interviewing Professor Jeff Chadwick. Over the years, you've published several articles addressing the dating of key scriptural events. Three such articles were recently combined and published together under the title, Dating Scripture Events. In this publication, you propose dates for the Savior's birth, his death, and when Lehi and his family left Jerusalem. Before we dig into that, I would love to know what led to these projects. Why did you decide to study and write on dating scripture? You can never talk too much about dating at BYU, <laughs> and so I, I, figured... I see what you did there. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured, why not bring it into the scholarly <laughs> discussion, good. right? Uh, no, uh, it's always interested me because my background in appreciating Scripture includes a kind of two components. Uh, I love Scripture for its spiritual value and what it teaches us about the gospel, the Savior, our Father in heaven 
And so I love the component of approaching the scriptures for their truth. And I bear witness to my students, the scriptures are true. But a thing that's fascinated me is the authenticity and the materiality of scripture, okay? Uh, These aren't just stories. They're not just myths. They're not like some religion uh, that is based upon a myth. Uh, Our scriptures are authentic, and I have a testimony that they are what they say they are. And it's always interested me to research that authenticity, whether it's a historical background, whether it's an archaeological background, whether it is a linguistic background, whatever the component is that adds into the scriptures, it interests me. So I love the materiality of them, and that's what leads to writing about any number of things in the scriptures, whether it's the archaeology of Jerusalem, which I published about, whether it's the, uh, the background of the New Testament and, say, the Sermon on the Mount, or whether it's dating. And because dating scripture events is tied to the reality of their existence in human history, it just naturally interested me, especially when we come up with, with LDS traditions about when Jesus was born or absolute dates in the, in the footnotes of the Book of Mormon, here's when Lehi left Jerusalem. Uh, if those are authentic stories, uh, do those dates pass the muster? Yeah. I, I think maybe we'll, we'll spend a little more time on this first one, which is dating the Savior's birth, and then link in the other ones as, as we go through. So it's probably safe to say, speaking of the Savior's birth, uh, that there's a common acceptance that he was born in April in the year 1 BC. First of all, like where does that understanding come from? Well, that's Elder Talmadge, right? I mean, that's he's the first one that says that. There were people who, even in the 1800s, both outside the church and inside the church, were advocating a spring birth time or, or, or birth period for Jesus. Um, some of this was, at least in the Protestant world, uh, a, a, a pushback against Catholic tradition. You know, Christianity is not like it is today, where everybody tries to get along. <laughs> it's been a lot of animosity, particularly between Protestant and Catholic over the centuries, and that's still very robust in the, uh, in the 1800s and in the early to mid-1900s. And so the idea of Christmas on December 25th, which was actually opposed by the Puritans, any celebration of it, right, only gradually crept into uh, American and European acceptance. But it was always pushed back against by Protestant uh, scholars who felt that, you know, the Catholic idea should be opposed by a better Protestant version. And as they reasoned when shepherds could be in the field, for example, keeping watch over their flocks by night, they thought, oh, that makes more sense in spring than winter. And um, there arose this idea gradually from the 1800s forward that Jesus was born in the spring. Elder Talmadge, playing off of the statement in Doctrine and Covenants section 20, verse 1, the rise of the church, right, Mm -hmm. being... 1,830 years since the Savior appeared in the flesh. Uh, he took that in the most literal sense of the time, ty- timing, and in his book, Jesus the Christ, said, we believe, which is a fairly concrete statement, this book, of course, Jesus the Christ, I loved. I read it as an 18-year-old to get ready to go on a mission in the 1970s. I still revere it, uh, but it's based on 19th century Protestant scholarship, which we know a lot more than the best Protestant scholars of the 1800s knew, right? Uh, But it was written in the temple, and it was written at the direction of the First Presidency, and so when it came out, people thought, this is the nearest thing to the next standard work we're going to have, Jesus the Christ, right? And it's still revered that way in the church. So when Elder Talmadge takes that very specific position about April 6th of 1 BC, uh, that carries a lot of authority. And I will tell you that I, I, I was very hesitant about how to approach in opening this discussion. If Elder Talmadge were alive today, he'd probably take some other things into consideration. Right. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But, but Elder, in, in saying that, Elder Talmadge isn't alone in this. 
And in fact, there are some other voices, even authoritative voices, speaking on this as well at the time, right? Well, Latter-day Saint authoritative voices that I mention in the article in BYU Studies include, uh, uh, you know, uh, J. Reuben Clark, member of the First Presidency, very smart man, one I admire a lot, and uh, Bruce R. McConkie, uh, whom we knew personally, right? Uh, just a giant of a, of a, a gospel scholar. And both of them, Elder McConkie actually uh, taking off of, of President Clark's view, looked to December and the, uh, the kind of the standard New Testament uh, commentary dating of Jesus being born in December of 5 BC. And when I first came across that many years ago as a young seminary teacher in that wonderful old book, Our Lord of the Gospels by J. Reuben Clark, I thought, what's this? This isn't what Elder Talmadge says, because I'd only read Jesus the Christ, right? And I'm like a 50-year seminary teacher, and I'm just discovering somebody else said something else about the date of Jesus, because I taught for years that Jesus was born on April 6th. I mean, it was the gospel for me. And then I read this book that's published decades after Jesus the Christ that says, oh, I think the best date to place Jesus' birth at is probably where scholarship places it in December of 5 B.C., this is President Clark of the First Presidency writing 20 years after Elder Talmadge. Like, oh, well, this is interesting. Uh, what do I do with this? Well, I guess it means that Latter-day Saints of authority and, and good spirit can, can see things differently. And so it's only after I discovered, you know, uh, President Clark and that Elder McConkie had basically followed President Clark's lead that I thought it's probably okay to open this subject and so I lead out before we discuss any other aspects of the dating of Jesus' birth in my article, Dating and Birth of Jesus Christ. Before we do anything else, we point out what 20th century apostles said. Elder Talmadge said this. President Clark and Elder McConkie said this. It's an open question. Let's look at what other data say. And, and so with that then, pushing back against that original assumption from, uh, from Elder Talmadge, the three primary considerations you mention are, number one, the date of the death of Herod the Great, number two, the date of the death of Jesus himself, and number three, the length of Jesus' mortal life. I would love it if you would just walk us through these, these three factors that you identified in this article. Well, these are very simple factors, right? But the, the, the difficulty of walking through is that people will say, well, what's the support for that? Okay. For that, you have to read the article. But the basic issue is that we know with, with virtually absolute certainty when Herod the Great died, and it was in early April of 4 BC. Now, Herod the Great was alive when Jesus was born, because Herod the Great is the one that sent to have the babies of Bethlehem killed. This is after Jesus was born. So if Herod dies in, in spring of 4 BC, Jesus has to have been born before the spring of 4 BC, and at least two to three months before. And this is something now, even... Yeah, why do you say that? Well, because there are a number of things that have to happen between Jesus' birth and the departure for Egypt. For example, Jesus has to be six weeks old, 40 days old, basically, before he's taken to the temple in Jerusalem, where Anna and Simeon ooh and awe over him as the new baby Messiah. And then uh, it's only after that time that the wise men can come and worship Jesus, as we read in Matthew chapter 2. And then Joseph and Mary skedaddle directly for Egypt. Okay, So Jesus has to have gone to the temple, or they has to have been taken to the temple as a baby before the departure to Egypt. So the departure to Egypt comes after the wise men have visited with Herod. So Herod is still alive at least six weeks and more likely uh, uh, seven to eight weeks after Jesus' birth. And then, you know, it could be longer than that. Some people argue that, that, uh, that Jesus was born up to two years before the wise men came because, you know, in... Matthew 2, uh, uh, Herod inquired of the wise man carefully about, you know, when they'd seen the sign. Um, and 
it says that he has the children two years and, and, and under killed. Well, there are a number of reasons for thinking that, that the wise men arrived to, to visit the baby Jesus within two to three months after his birth and not two years after his birth. And I go through these in, in, in the article. The easiest fit for this is to backdate it from about the end of March, six to eight weeks, and that would put it into January and even better in December. I mentioned something else that happens, and that is the Annunciation to Mary. Okay? The Annunciation to Mary uh, takes place in what is called the sixth month, and this is noted in Luke chapter 1. Many people have assumed this was the sixth month of um, Elizabeth's pregnancy because it's written in a very compact form. And I think that in the sixth month that's being talked about, Elizabeth also just happens coincidentally to have been six months pregnant. But Luke started his narratives, the narrative parts of Jesus' life, by giving an accepted formula that was known in Syria for dating. And to say the sixth month would mean the sixth month after the fall new year, both in the Syrian calendar and in the Jewish calendar after Rosh Hashanah. So the sixth month would be sometime in um, Adar, which is the Jewish month that's roughly late February to late March. So that the Annunciation comes to Mary in the sixth month, which is probably mid to late March. So the bottom line is this first factor, it's linked with the date of the death of Herod the Great. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that in and of itself pushes back against the assumption that, that it's it 1 BC. 1 BC. Can't be 1 BC. Yeah. And it can't be April of 1 BC, can't be April of 2 BC, can't be April of 3 BC, can't even be April of 4 BC. Some have proposed April of 5 or 6 BC. Now, it can't be either of those because of the length of Jesus' life, which, which we know to have been 33 years and perhaps just a little bit beyond 33 years, but, but nowhere near 34 years. And we know that from the Book of Mormon. The Bible doesn't report that, but thankfully we have the Book of Mormon. Okay? So from the time that Jesus is born, you count forward 33 years and maybe as much as three or four months, but not 33 and a half years. And you have to arrive at a time when Jesus could conceivably have died. So then, in the first article, dating the birth of Jesus Christ, we also investigate what the likely date of Jesus' death was. Okay? And then we, write, we follow up with a second article in BYU Studies in 2015 entitled Dating the Death of Jesus Christ, which gives a lot more information about that. And when it comes right down to it, Jesus has to have died in the spring of the year 30. Not 33, as reported in, or as alluded to in the, in the book, Jesus the Christ, but the year 30, as accepted in President Clark's treatment, Our Lord of the Gospels, and as accepted by Elder McConkie in his Mortal Messiah series, and as the consensus of New Testament scholarship leans toward. The, the majority of all New Testament scholars would say the year 30 is when Jesus died. And since he died at Passover, it has to be the spring of the year 30. Okay? So the spring of the year 30 just happens to be 33 years and three months after December of 5 BC. And the Book of Mormon stipulates that the 30th and 4th year had begun when the sign of Jesus' death is given to the Nephites. So that means that 33 full years had passed away, and you're into the 34th year. And, and now I think um, I, I was really interested in a number of thing, these things that you talked about. So you have the date of the death of Herod the Great, Number two, the date of the death of Jesus himself, with, which you just discussed, right. and then the length of Jesus' mortal ministry. Which we only know from the Book of Mormon. Okay, Biblical scholars alone can't do that kind of math. You have to have the Book of Mormon. Which, which leads to something that I actually wanted to read, and, and this is from the second article that you wrote, which elaborated on the, the dating of Jesus' death. Right. And, and in your conclusion... Uh, you said this, 
To readers of this study who may not be Latter-day Saints, those of other faiths and backgrounds, Christian and otherwise, who may hesitate to give credence to evidence from the Book of Mormon, I would suggest that the issues presented in this study from the New Testament, the Mishnah, and the historical and astronomical studies alone are more than enough to definitively demonstrate the dating of Jesus' death to the year AD 30, uh, and, then, and then you go on. Which, which I, I appreciate, and I, I think you, you certainly have made a compelling case, but this is, this is why I'm, I'm bringing it up. That said, this is again to quote your conclusion to that article, as a, Latter- as a Latter-day Saint, I am not only duty-bound, but personally grateful to accept and present data from the Book of Mormon, the genuine historical reliability of which I am both spiritually and materially convinced to corroborate the evidence of the New Testament and the other avenues explored. To all this, I add my additional conviction, and then you you go on and, and uh, testify of the resurrection of the Savior. So maybe just walk us through what role did the Book of Mormon play in, in these two articles specifically? Well, the Book of Mormon is key. I was raised in a family that was not active, LDS, but, but uh, because I work so much outside the Church, I have to say not practicing, okay? So... Um, my first experience with scriptural things was just Christmas stories and the Bible. Uh, the first time I heard a biblical verse quoted, the first time I heard any verse of scripture quoted is when Linus quotes the Christmas story on the Charlie Brown Christmas special. And people will laugh about this, but that moved me so much as a 10-year-old. Uh, at that moment when Linus says, you know, uh, behold, you know, uh, unto you is born this day a Savior, you know. And I, it's funny that uh, the Spirit would bear witness to a 10-year-old during a cartoon, but it did. And I had to look that up. My grandmother gave me a Bible that Christmas. Uh, I was... Uh, 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 I she she noted that I was so impressed by it because I watched it on her color TV back then in 1966 that uh, she gave me a Bible. I never opened a Book of Mormon till I was 14 years old and took seminary. Uh, uh, but uh, but I so I read the Bible first and I started reading it when I was 10, 11 years old, and I not only read books of the New Testament but of the Old Testament and I fell in love with it. But then, as a ninth grader, I took Book of Mormon, because everybody did, you know, I, and I fell in love with that, too, because it felt just like the Bible to me. But what I learned when I went on a mission, eventually, is that so much that you have in the Bible is supplemented by information that you have in the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Mormon is supplemented by the Bible. They don't operate separately, and one is not superior over the other. They are one in our hand. And grow together. The stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph. And so you need to use them that way. You need to shuffle them together like a deck of cards and see how one relates to the other. And that's why there was no question you have to consider what the Book of Mormon has to say if you're going to deal with biblical questions about the life and dating of Jesus' ministry, because the Book of Mormon has key datum points in it, not only in 3rd Nephi, but going all the way back to 1st Nephi, where Lehi is said to, to have left Jerusalem 600 years before Messiah would come. That's another date we deal with, and that was my third article, Dating Lehi's Departure. Let's go there. This is what you write at the beginning of that article. Beginning with the 2013 English edition of the Book of Mormon, all date notations were moved from the bottom of every right-hand page, except for the Book of Ether, to the end of each chapter heading, a distinct and I believe quite significant change was made in 1 Nephi 2, the bottom of the page note 600 BC, was moved to the chapter heading and revised to about 600 BC. This slight equivocation from exactly 600 BC to about 600 BC invites us to inquire where the dating schema originated and why it merited change. So let's use that as our framework now for this next part of the discussion. First of all, Let's do look first at where the dating schema originated. In With the Book of Mormon that I grew up with, the Book of Mormon that anybody who's older than 20 grew up with, was what we call the 1920 edition. And it was Elder Talmadge that put the date asterisks 
at the bottom of each of the pages so that if you have a Book of Mormon that dates from before 2013, it's going to have in 1 Nephi 2 that Lehi leaves Jerusalem 600 B.C., okay? And that's because... Lehi prophesies, and it's later emphasized by others, that the Messiah would come 600 years after, as Nephi put it, my father left Jerusalem. So once you write about the dating the birth of Christ and you align it to the real death date of Herod the Great, and it has to be before spring of 4 BC, that means that Lehi has to have left Jerusalem before the spring of 604 BC. And, and so let's let's build on that then. So in this article, you begin with kind of a literature review of uh, a handful of people who have tried approaching um, appro- uh, approaching this dating. Walk us through that. The the departure of Lehi from Jerusalem and dating it is fraught with landmines for a number of reasons. Okay, not only because of the prophecy of six hundred years from Lehi's departure to to the coming of Jesus, which we take to be his birth, okay? But because the first year of the reign of King Zedekiah is mentioned in terms of not Lehi's departure, but Lehi's revelation that starts his ministry sometime before his departure. And it's not clear how long, but I think it could have been as much as three years, three, four years. So there's that. You're figuring in Zedekiah's first year, and also when what would have been a date that was 600 years before Jesus was born. And then you also have to figure out what I call the political conversation of First Nephi, which is basically that Babylon looks like it's a danger, but it's a danger that's still on the horizon. It hasn't arrived in Jerusalem to beat you up yet. We know that the Babylonians arrive and essentially take over the area of Judah in the summer of 604 BC. Hmm. This is when the cities that were were 20 miles from Jerusalem were conquered and destroyed by the Babylonians. These would be Philistine cities like Ekron and Ashkelon. And uh, the Babylonians were in the region destroying in 604 BC. They didn't destroy... Uh, Judah and Jerusalem, because Judah and Jerusalem were not considered to be uh, directly uh, a danger to Babylonian interests the way that the Philistine cities were, because the Philistine cities had allied so strongly with the Egyptians. But you have the Babylonians in the region and having essentially taken, taken um, uh, you know, formal control of Judah in 604 B.C., but in the Book of Mormon conversation, the Babylonians aren't there yet. And, and you know, people like Laman and Lemuel say, ah, oh, Jerusalem's in no danger. The great city could never be destroyed. It's pretty obvious that a major city 20 miles from Jerusalem would not have been destroyed when Laman, Lemon, Laman and Lemuel were saying that. Because they wouldn't have made that comment. Because they wouldn't have made that comment because Jerusalem would be really in danger of being destroyed if it made one wrong move, which it later was, okay? So... The departure from Jerusalem to fit the conversation of 1 Nephi has to have been before the summer of 604 BC. That works out really good. If you posit Jesus as being born in December of 5 BC, you can posit Lehi's departure in November or December of 605 BC, and it works out really well. And so Lehi never has to deal, and neither do his sons returning to Jerusalem to get Ishmael's family. They don't have to deal with the arrival of the Babylonians because all that happens after. If Lehi leaves, as we propose in our article, in, say, November of 605 BC, he's probably only in the Valley of Lemuel for two, at the outside, three months before they leave to move into the Arabian Peninsula. And it's in that time, which is basically the winter when rivers are running and there's water and you can live in a desert valley without baking, um, that both trips back to Jerusalem are made. And they would both have been made before the Babylonians arrive in the area. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as these publications, 
BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place to check out. The RSC has just published a new book called The Book of Moses, From the Ancient of Days to the Latter Days, edited by Aaron Shade and Matthew Bowen. The Book of Moses is canonized scripture spanning the epics of creation, Adam and Eve, Enoch, and Noah. Its content was revealed anciently by God to Moses and re-revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith in modern times. This book explores the origins and development of the Book of Moses, its ancient nuances, the linguistic features of its revelations, and how its sweeping visions and rich doctrines inspired and guided Joseph Smith and the early members of the church in their pursuit of Zion. Again, the book is called The Book of Moses, From the Ancient of Days to the Latter Days. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Ryan Sharp interview Professor Jeff Chadwick about his trilogy of fascinating articles on dating scripture events. In part two of Why Religion, we like to get into why this research matters, which Professor Chadwick himself admits, some have asked why knowing these dates even matters at all. It's a really good question, and here's his answers. I want to focus for a minute on on applications, and I know we addressed this a little bit earlier in the interview, but I want to circle back to it now. So imagine I'm a student in your class. I can tell you are excited about discussing these ideas and the dates and and such, and it's clear that you're passionate about them and and insightful with them. What would you say to me, I'm a student in your class, to help me understand the implications of uh, the, the proposed dates? In the classroom, we're religious educators. We're building knowledge and faith and testimony. And we're doing those in equal portions because knowledge serves faith and testimony. Faith and testimony tend to increase the thirst for knowledge. Okay? So when I'm teaching First Nephi or when I'm teaching Luke chapter 1 and 2 or Matthew chapter 1 and 2, these, these, these things about you know Lehi leaving Jerusalem after his revelations and ministry there— or the birth of Jesus, the visit of the wise men, the annunciation to Mary, et cetera, et cetera, or in teaching about the death of Jesus. Um, in any class, I'll always try to give a modicum of background because that paints the palette for the wonderful, for the wonderful story that you're presenting with those hues and colors of testimony and of, uh, of commentary by by apostolic authorities and by wonderful, you know, commentators and etc. But while I'll tell them the background, I don't press the background. Now, our best evidence suggests that Jesus was born in 5 BC. Some of you have heard that, you know, and maybe read that Jesus was born in April of 1 BC. If you're interested in seeing what the difference would be, here's where you can read about it. But I don't take the date of Lehi's departure from Jerusalem or the date of Jesus' birth or the date of Jesus' death as even, you know, in the top 10 of the important things I do when teaching about the Savior or about the Book of Mormon. They are another thing that enhances my understanding and testimony, but I never make them the main issue. So my articles, which, by the way, you get for free— on the BYU Studies website. Um, I always make available to students, but I don't make them required reading. I say, here are some options if you'd like to know why I suggest that Jesus was, rather than this date that you may have heard. And if you're interested, go see it. If you're not, remember the lessons of spirituality that that we take from these things, you know, that... uh, that I will go and do the things the Lord commands because he always makes a way. And those are the things that, that, that I teach in the classroom. And the other is part of the palette that people can color if they'd like to themselves. Let's play hypothetical again. This time I'm driving in my car, listening to this interview. I've heard all of my life things like, Jesus was born on April 6th, and that's why it's so significant that the church was restored on this date. Or... Jesus' birth was so significant that the entire calendaring system was adjusted to align with it. So I'm driving in my car. I hear these things that you're presenting. Help me, help me process how, how uh, the things you're presenting 
um, bump up against some of these assumptions that I may be making as I drive along the freeway in my car. For a long time there in the 50s and 60s, Elder Talmadge's view of things grew to be the predominant one, and President Clark's was essentially off the table. Um, This changed when Elder McConkie published his Messiah series, which a lot of us back in the early 80s started to read, you know, and we're starting to notice, hey, Elder McConkie thinks differently than Elder Talmadge. And not only that, um, Elder McConkie thinks different in 1980 than he did in 1970. (laughs) Because Elder McConkie was this remarkable person that had the ability to adapt and to move away from previous positions he'd taken that he now understood better. I've always hoped to be that kind of a gospel student, that the more I learned, if it meant I had to change the way I understand something, I was willing to do that. Now, when I saw what happened in the 2013 edition of the Scriptures, particularly the Book of Mormon, that those notations about the dating had been moved from the bottom of the page to the... um, to the um, uh, chapter, chapter headings. headings, and that the significant one, you know, 600 BC, now became about 600 BC. I thought that is that is such an indication of how we've matured in in our approach to these things. Somewhere the decision had been made that we ought to equivocate on this a little bit because maybe it's not as fixed in cement as we yeah. previously thought. And I think there are a couple of of really important lessons there. One is some things really are more important than others. The fact that Jesus is born is significantly more important than the exact date. And then the other is being open to some of this ambiguity as as we gain further understanding and and as scholarship progresses. And I I, I love this discussion. I think it's so important for us to keep those things in mind. Well, if we don't learn to grow line upon line, precept upon precept. If we in the church are stuck in 1970 or in 1977, let's say, for example, if we can't get up to speed with June of 1978, and if we can't get up to speed with other changes that were made in, say, the early 1990s, and even recent changes in policy and procedure of the church, if we can't ourselves, you know, grow and move beyond where we were before, we're not going to be able to keep up with the kingdom. And one of the things that I've seen about myself as a religious educator over 41 years now is that almost against my will, I found myself having to grow out of ways that I used to think about things and be willing to have my mind changed by the evidence and also by authoritative revelation and proclamation. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting combination of things. Evidence on the one hand, because as you're talking about the things of Scripture, it has to do with a lot of, a lot of evidence, but also the way the church operates, authoritative decisions to move in directions that may be a different tangent than where we were before. But that's where we're at. And if we if we are not flexible uh, in the way that we grow, and if, if we don't accommodate flexibility in our testimony, we'll be too brittle and something will eventually break us. If you want to read Dr. Chadwick's articles that were published in BYU Studies on dating the birth and death of Jesus Christ and Lehi's departure from Jerusalem, we've included a link to the full text of all three of these articles on our website, whyreligion.byu.edu. There you can also learn more about Professor Chadwick and also find past episodes and links to their publications. And while I have you, if you're an Instagrammer, Remember to give us a follow on Instagram at Why Religion Podcast to get quotes from the episodes and be part of the Why Religion community. Well, we've arrived at our last segment of Why Religion, where we like to explore some of the whys behind our professor's academic journey and their faith. So we end this episode with Professor Jeff Chadwick sharing his story and beliefs to these why questions. 
Let's transition to kind of the third segment of our interview. And and this one's a little bit more personal where we'll we'll pry into your previous studies, what led you to BYU, kind of tell us your story, but let's begin with this. Uh, just tell us about your your academic training, uh, the the degrees that you received and from where, and then maybe why you why you decided to go the path that you did academically. Well, most of that is an accident. It's a happy accident of one door closing, another door opening uh, with no real design. Uh, I never intended to be a, a, a Near Eastern archaeologist when I was growing up. I didn't even begin my career as a religious educator with the idea that one day I would be a biblical archaeologist. It just happened. Um, one thing led to another. I didn't ever think uh, when I began teaching seminary in 1979 that I would teach at the Jerusalem Center uh, over a period of 40 years. It didn't even occur to me. But once I got teaching the Bible and once it was announced there would be a Jerusalem Center, which also happened in the fall of 1979, I thought, boy, that'd be fun to do someday. Uh, And doors just opened. Um, I took a I took a bachelor's degree from Weber State College in the 1970s in political science because I was always you know a, a, an animal interested in in how people feel and how people run things and um, but when I when I decided rather than going to politics to accept an opportunity that was offered to me to become a, a seminary teacher I didn't I didn't think I would ever do this but I was actually recruited. By, by several institute teachers, why don't you look at teaching seminary? And I did it, frankly, honestly, because they offered to pay for my graduate work, because I wanted to get a master's degree. And BYU had a nice program in international relations. We'll pay for your master's degree. So I agreed t- to teach for three years and work on a master's. And by the time I got the master's degree, which turned out to be a double master's because I did international relations, but I also did ancient biblical geography. And this was from BYU then? Yeah, from okay. BYU. Uh, I, was, I was sold on teaching religious education. I didn't want to quit teaching seminary. So I stick with, stuck with it. And that very same year, they said, why don't you keep, come teach for us in Jerusalem because you have a master's in biblical geography. We need a guy this summer. It was just out of the blue. Nobody gets that today, but it dropped on me because in the early 80s, uh, they were <laughs> the, the barrel was pretty shallow and they'd got <laughs> to the bottom, okay? Uh, and so just one thing happened after another. And after a few years, uh, the director of the Jerusalem Center said, you know, if you're going to stick with us when we open our new building, you're going to have to get a doctorate. I really didn't want to get a doctorate, but I thought, well, I'd like to keep working with these people, so I'll go get a doctorate. And so I started in a couple of things. I had to decide eventually between Egyptian, Hebrew, archaeology. Uh, David Galbraith said, Hebrew people, there's a lot of them. Egyptian people, there's a lot of them. We don't have any archaeologists. So I did Hebrew and Egyptian as the minor, did the archaeology as the major, got it done, and boom was there. It's a long story how I got to be with religious education at BYU because I taught in the institutes for years. But uh, it, it's been one thing after another that you couldn't have planned it. It was it was a journey that was just fun all the way. It managed to pay the bills with just a little bit left over to save. <laughs> but Every time you went somewhere, there was this new door where people were inviting you with a need to come and do something. So we went and did it. And I'm a living example of you can try and plan things out, but you better be ready for them not to go the way you planned, but to go the way that you're being guided. Yeah. Let's maybe end with this. And and you've expressed your testimony throughout this interview in different ways. I'd love to hear... What is it that roots you in the restoration? What, what, what is it that causes you to believe? Well, there were two things. Um, first of all, as I said, I didn't grow up in, in a family that was active, but I had some pretty good friends that once I began to be a teenager, they were, they were pretty persistent about that I ought to go to church with them. And so I did. I was active in Mutual and the Scouts and, and, uh, and, and would go to church and got ordained to be a teacher and a deacon and, 
was always riding with somebody else to go to church. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm a testimony of invite your friends to church, okay? Uh, but in terms of what, what roots me outside the sociality of the church, which I love, I have a testimony by direct revelation that Joseph Smith is a prophet. One year in the late 1960s, we went on an ironic priesthood outing. We used to go on big outings in those days. And we went down to Temple Square and toured the tabernacle as a ward. You know, everybody from the high priest to the deacons went. And, and uh, we got these, these um, uh, brochures, these pamphlets. And one of them was Joseph Smith's testimony, the old one with the picture of Joseph Smith with the papers in his hand standing on the front. And it was basically the story that's in Joseph Smith history in the Pearl Great Price, but it was in pamphlet form. It's a missionary tract. Well, I came home with this thing because I didn't know what a Doctrine and Covenants was. We didn't own one in our family. And um, I actually hadn't been in seminary yet, okay? This, I, I think I was in the eighth grade that year. But I had this pamphlet because I'd been on this priesthood outing. Here's a, here's a kid who's passing the sacrament and doesn't really know anything about the gospel. I just went to church because friends were there. And I liked it. Okay, So we went on this outing. I came home with this pamphlet. And I remember... In the spring of, of 1969, in late May, maybe a week after May 15th, sitting out under a maple tree, sunny day in May, on a chase lounge, and I was just almost 14, and I had that pamphlet with me that I'd picked up the week before. And I decide, I'm going to read this. It looks interesting. Who is Joseph Smith? So I'm reading this pamphlet for the first time, and I read the story of Joseph Smith, the first vision, the visits of Moroni, okay, the golden plates. And I am telling you that it was as if I was seeing them. I knew with the most powerful feeling that you get in life that these things were true. So other than Jesus, whom I'd come to through the Charlie Brown series and reading some of the Bible when I was 10, I now knew Joseph Smith was a prophet. And the next thing was, as a ninth grader in seminary, my friends insisted that I ought to take seminary with them. So I did. And it was a Book of Mormon year. And I read the Book of Mormon. And I knew that was true. And so I had the, I had the three. And so it's Joseph Smith as a prophet that I know by personal revelation is true. And it's the Book of Mormon that I learned by study, and that same revelation is true, that grounds me in the restoration. And so the Book of Mormon particularly, but my testimony of the testimony of Joseph Smith are the two anchors of the restoration for me. Everything else is very interesting, okay? Uh, church history from the, rest or from the organization through the Kirtland Temple, through Nauvoo, that's all very interesting to me. And I have testimonies of those events, but the anchors are what I got when I was very young, and they were very personal. And when some people asked, you know, is there anything that could ever cause you to, to become disgruntled and, and move away, I say... I couldn't do it, okay? I could become upset about some things, but I could never deny and, and, and move away because I know the Book of Mormon is real and true. I know Joseph Smith was a prophet. And because of them, I know the Bible's true. And because of them, I want to know more about those books. I want to know more about that Bible, and I want to know more about that Book of Mormon. And I want to know more about Joseph Smith. That's where it all is to me. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of Religious Education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, Professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, Ryan Sharp, and Hank Smith. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Mitchell Bashford. Say hi, Mitchell. Hi, guys. 
Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.